All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I seem to have no control over the room volume. So this might be uh, a little echoey in here today. I have to have the volume on in order to record the video, though. Um, otherwise, there won't be any volume on the lecture recording. Yeah, it's not working. Okay, so this is um, CISC 124, Introduction to Computer Science 2. So for most of you, it should be your second or third uh, computing programming course. Sorry, I'm just kidding. Okay, so who am I? So I'm Dr. Burton Ma. You, know, you don't have to call me doctor. Doctor's fine, Burton's fine. Uh, my office is in Goodwin Hall on the seventh floor. So I take the elevator up, turn left when you get out at the seventh floor, go through the double doors, turn right, and my office will be down that hallway. Uh, office hours are on on queue. Actually, everything's on on queue. I'm just going to switch to on queue in a second. Uh, if you email me for any reason, uh, please put CISC124 somewhere in the subject line or in the body of the message so that I know uh, what course you're in. Uh, I teach three courses this term. Uh, so if you don't put CISC124 in the subject line, I don't know who you are, what course you're in. Uh, and then I have to look you up and I get very annoyed. And yeah, So please put uh, 124 in the subject line. All right, so I'm just gonna jump over to OnQ right now. Uh, if you haven't looked at OnQ already, uh, you you're gonna wanna do so pretty short, uh, pretty soon. Okay, so there's my contact information. There are my office hours starting next week. Uh, you shouldn't need to see me this week. Uh, if you do, send me an email, we'll try to work something out. Um, basically, it's when Tuesdays through Thursdays uh, in the afternoon, so 2.30 to 3.30. Uh, if I'm there, and if I'm, if I'm in my office, you can always knock, come in um, and uh, Normally, under most circumstances, I'll be happy to see you. Uh, occasionally, the Thursday office hour will have to be canceled or rescheduled because of our departmental meetings uh, that happen, I don't remember which Thursday of the month, but um, once a month, there is a Thursday departmental meeting that I have to go to uh, that overlaps with my office hour. Okay, you have uh, five teaching assist five, four or five teaching assistants this term. Um, I have to update their emails. Uh, these may not necessarily be the ones the TAs want to use. Uh, they will have a weekly office hour on Teams. So every week, starting next week, uh, you can jump onto Teams um, during their scheduled office hour. It doesn't matter which TA you talk to, um, and you can uh, ask them questions about the course or most likely the assignments. There's the link uh, for, the, uh, for each TA's office hour. Um, they're all, they all go through the general uh, channel of the CISC, 140, CISC 124 team that's been created. All right, you can see uh, the assignments and your test dates are already in on queue, so you can see them. Uh, and let's go to that next. So under content, uh, you can find out about the course here. Somewhere, okay. So the delivery of the course materials, there's no text course. Um, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, what is this course about? I'll get to that in a second too. Um, now, if you actually want a textbook or another reference book, uh, there isn't one available to you in the bookstore because um, the publishers charge you like two or three hundred dollars for book. Uh, so it's kind of crazy. If you want one, if you really want a textbook, uh, you can buy one off of Amazon or Indigo or something like that. Uh, they will have them. They are very expensive. Um, that one's a good one if you can uh, track it down. Um, it is a good book, uh, but it is wildly overpriced, uh, in my opinion. Um, if you want an online reference and still in a book form, the library has a bazillion Java textbooks or Java reference books, I guess is a better way to put it. Uh, there's one that's quite good, uh, so you have free access to that. Uh, this book here is for more advanced Java programmers or for people who want to improve their Java programming. Uh, this is written by the person who, one of the people who created the language itself. Um, and it has all sorts of valuable information, especially for professional Java programmers. Okay, grading scheme. So the grading scheme uh, is basically assignments, two tests, and an exam. Uh, and so your first assignment is, um, is straightforward compared to the other ones. The other ones aren't very hard either, but um, I mean, they're not enormously difficult. Um, so the first one's worth 5%. Uh, it'll be due in a couple of weeks. Well, less than a couple of weeks. It'll go up later this week, uh, so you'll have access to that. Uh, if you program in Java, 
before, it'll be very straightforward. Uh, it basically involves translating a Python program into a Java program. Uh, and then the following assignments are worth a little bit more. So in total, you've got 40% of your work in assignments. If you complete the assignments, um, preferably on your own, um, and you actually manage to complete the assignment and it seems to satisfy the assignment criteria, you're probably gonna get an A or better on the assignment. Uh, and so you should be able to knock somewhere between 30 and 40 marks uh, out of 100 quite easily just by doing the assignment. Uh, and then you have the two tests. They're held uh, in class, uh, so the dates are there. Uh, they are written, um, so bring a pen or a pencil. Um, uh, and uh, you've got 50 minutes to do the test. If you have uh, accommodations registered with Ventus, of course you write it with the exams office uh, and they'll take care of you over there. The exam is scheduled by the registrar. Um, it's worth 25% of your mark. Uh, it's not normally comprehensive. So in other words, it doesn't really cover uh, or specifically cover everything in the course. Um, this course is a bit unusual, however. Uh, so the material in this course starts today and builds all the way to the end. Uh, if you have difficulty somewhere in the course, before the end of the course, um, the stuff after it becomes um, either impossible to do or more difficult to do. Uh, and so you have to make sure you keep up in the course, right? So even though the exam is not comprehensive, the questions that you get asked essentially require you to know most of the material in the course anyway. Right. Okay, so, um, probably trying to get into a computing plan or how have already been accepted to a computing plan. If you're trying to get into the plan, the problem with this course is that you might need a B in this course, right? So uh, one of the requirements to get into a computing plan is that you get a B in 121 or 124, right? It is easier to get the B in 121 than it is to get the B in 124. So roughly 60, 50. Somewhere between 50 and 60% of students do not get a B in this course. Right? They get a grade that's a little bit lower or much worse. The average is typically around 70 something, right? But the average is skewed high. So the students who, uh, many students do very well in this course. Lots of A's and A pluses. Um, uh, but there are a, I mean, there are a large number of students who don't get the B, right? So to get the B, make sure you do your assignments, right? Pass your tests, so get a 50 on your tests and you will get the B pretty much. Uh, or you'll be very close anyway, right? So if you're concerned about getting into a computing plan, that's what you're aiming for, right? Make sure you do the assignments, uh, make sure you're able to uh, at least pass the tests uh, and the exam, everything will be fine. Okay, late assignments. So there is a universal three-day accommodation uh, policy for this course. That means everybody gets three extra days to do your assignment. So your assignment has an official due date, right? Uh, if you don't get it completed by the due date, that's fine, right? You have another 72 hours to submit your work. You don't email me, you don't email the TAs, right? You just submit it on OnCue, everything's fine, right? No one's gonna care if it's late, right? There's no penalty for late work. Uh, now, after the three days, however, the OnCue submission sh shuts off and you can't submit your work anymore. Uh, and so, um, if you're going to take advantage, sorry, if you require the need of the accommodation, uh, then make sure you submit your work um, before the three days are, are up. Uh, this says that any work that's submitted by the due date is eligible for grading. All that means is that um, if you submit something before the due date, uh, at the due date, in principle, the TAs can start marking. That never happens, right? So um, generally what happens is we wait three days and then the TAs start marking. Uh, so you have two tests in class. So there, the test is that there are no makeup tests. So if you miss the first test, um, or if you miss one test, for an academically valid reason, and that's the important part there, right, you still have to apply for academic accommodation. Uh, then the weight of the test is shifted to the exam, no questions asked, other than to make sure that it is an academically valid reason. Right, now, there are occasionally a small number of students who miss both tests for some reason, um, the students can often come up with a, what seems to be a valid reason for doing so. Um, in, this in those cases, we have to come up with, uh, they have to be treated uh, on a case basis. Normally what happens is I make you write the second test at some point. Finally, the missed exam is the uh, standard missed exam for the faculty of arts and science. 
miss the exam for a valid reason, you apply for academic accommodation. If it's granted, there is a deferred exam date scheduled by the exams office. In extreme circumstances, uh, we have to come to some other arrangement. So you have to write your exam at some other time. Uh, so for example, someone has to write their winter exam two weeks from now. Uh, so it does occasionally happen. Right? Uh, again, in those cases, you must contact me in order to um, uh, make arrangements uh, to write the exam. All right, any questions so far? Super. Uh, what else is there? Okay, so let's jump back to, hang on, I just got to jump over. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to, these are the notebooks that we use, that I use in this course. Uh, I just have to make sure that they're still running. Okay. Okay, uh, let's jump back to the slides quickly. Okay, teaching assistants, textbooks. Uh, there are a couple of extra textbooks listed on this slide. Uh, I checked the links last night, so they are working if you want to look at them. Uh, grading we've talked about. Assignments we talked about, yes. Tests we talked about. Exam. Okay, so what exactly is this course about? Uh, so there is the calendar description. It probably doesn't mean anything to you if you don't know what object-oriented programming is, and that's basically what this course is about. Right, and so the goal of this course is to introduce you to object-oriented programming using this language called Java. Right, so what the heck is object-oriented programming? So if your only programming background is from 121 or a previous computing science course, uh, you would have used Python. Uh, you might have seen a little bit of object-oriented programming in Python, probably not very much. Um, the type of programming that you did in Python was basically you wrote functions uh, you might have used variables somewhere in your Python script, right? And then you call the functions from within your script uh, to perform some sort of work, right? Uh, so that's an example of structured programming. Uh, so that's basically what you learned in 121. So you have things like loops, you've got functions, you've got conditionals, so if statements, um, and other things like that, right? Okay, so object-oriented programming, it still has all of these things. So it still has loops still has conditions, it still has function, well, things that look like function calls. Um, but uh, instead of organizing your program into functions uh, and possibly modules, uh, you organize your program into things that you use to make objects. So your running program is made up of these things called objects. Each object carries with it some information. Right? So the data is stored in objects rather than being stored somewhere in your program uh, as a variable. And the objects can uh, operate on that information that they have. So they have what's called behavior. Uh, and so they can use the information that they have, perform some sort of computation, um, and perhaps return that value back to the caller. Right? Because all of your information and behavior is um, contained in these objects, a running program typically involves of a whole bunch of objects that are talking to one another, right? So they pass messages one another by calling methods, right? The individual objects do whatever work they need to do and uh, put it all together and you end up with a running program, right? Uh, if you continue in computing science, you'll eventually run into a course called SIS360 uh, and you'll learn that there are many, many, many other ways to uh, perform programming. They're not necessarily structured programming. They're not necessarily object-oriented programming. There's some other way of writing a program. Uh, if you Google for programming paradigms, um, you'll look at the Wikipedia article, you'll see that the list of many, 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 many different ways uh, to write a computer program. Right. All right, so we're using Java, not Python. So what the heck is Java? Uh, so Java, uh, it's pretty, uh, it's similar in many respects. To, uh, so they're both general purpose languages, that means you can uh, use both languages to uh, target many different kinds of problems. They're both cross-platform, so you can run Java and Python on many different types of computers. You can run them on a desktop computer, you can run them on a laptop, on a tablet, or on a uh, cell phone, right? or uh, many other different types of computing devices. Right? Uh, and finally, it's object-oriented, which is good, because this is an object-oriented programming course. Um, when you look at Java and compare it to Python, you'll see that Python does some things um, in a nicer way than Java. Right? So it's easier, for example, to print something in Python than it is in Java. 
Uh, and that's because Java is a uh, slightly older language than Python. It was created in the 1990s, uh, and primarily to address the problems with the dominant languages at the time. Uh, so at that time, the dominant programming languages were these things called C and C++. Right? You learn about C uh, in C++, uh, you learn about C++ in 5.3.2 something, I don't remember now. Um, so these two languages are still really used uh, in the real world. Okay, so the creators of the language had a bunch of goals. These aren't really important for us right now. Um, and it has since become uh, quite a popular language. So Python, Java, and the other C-like languages, so C and C++, uh, typically show up in the top languages used um, uh, in the industry. Uh, and they always they constantly change their order. Sometimes C's at the top, sometimes up, sometimes Python's at the top. I think right now Python's at the top, but not by a very wide margin. Okay, so where is it used? Well, it's used in a lot of places, but it's really used, so the first three are basically all under this category of call, what's called enterprise software. Uh, so enterprise software is the software that very large organizations use internally. Uh, typically, a typical user would not normally see this kind of software, would not be exposed to this kind of software. You guys are because you have to use uh, Solus and stuff like that. That would be an example of enterprise software. I have no idea what it's written in. Whatever is written in is garbage. So anyway, um, so it's used a, a lot uh, in the big companies. Right? They have lots and lots of employees, lots and lots of computers. Um, they have lots and lots of different systems that all need to talk to one another. Java is often the language that's used uh, to do that kind of programming. Embedded devices are uh, devices that don't look like computers. Um, so, for example, uh, or don't necessarily look like computers, right? So, for example, if you have some sort of like a Fitbit, uh, that would be an example of an, uh, your router on the wall. Uh, so that Wi-Fi router that's sitting up the wall over there, that's an example of an embedded device, right? It doesn't have a screen, it doesn't have a keyboard. There's no obvious way to connect to it, uh, but there is a computer or computers inside uh, running. Uh, Java is often one of the languages used uh, to program these devices. Some scientific applications use Java, uh, although uh, many scientific applications do. Uh, in particular, NASA is a big user of Java. Uh, and then finally, there are some video games that are written in Java. Uh, so notably, the first version of Minecraft was written in Java. More recently, I guess, uh, it's mostly indie games. So for example, Slay the Spire, if you know what that is, uh, was written, the original was written in Java. Um, but it's not widely used uh, to program. It's certainly not used for any of your AAA video games. It doesn't have the performance that's required. Um, but it is used a lot, uh, a lot. It's used um, in, uh, uh, in, some, in some indie games. There's a little link if you want to see uh, some examples of real world applications that have been written in Java. It's a fairly recent article um, written by the people who now maintain uh, Java. Okay, so uh, one of the questions you might be asking is, well, look, you, sent, you spent one or two courses teaching me Python. Why aren't we still using Python? It's good to use as a future computer scientist uh, to learn many different languages. Um, so here's a new language that we're gonna use. Uh, the other reason for using Java is that in your second and third year courses, uh, and your fourth year courses, uh, you're going to start to use uh, C and C++ um, for, your, for your courses, right? Uh, and it's easier to switch to C or to C and C++ if you know, instead of if you just knew Python. Switching from Python to C or C++ would be a very traumatic experience. Um, so switching from Java to C or C++ is a much uh, nicer experience. Primarily because Java borrows the core language from C anyway. Right? So the way you write a loop, the way you write an if statement, the way you declare variables in C and Java is identical. Right, so eventually you need your courses. Um, it's good for you if we introduce you a language that looks something like C rather than just looks like Python. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna switch back to my browser to make sure that my uh, notebooks are still running. Okay. 
And I'll explain why I have to do this in just a second. OK, so Java in this course, obviously, you need to get Java installed on your computers. If you go to OnQ, you will find instructions for getting uh, Java installed on your computer. So under course readings and resources, you can find instructions for installing course software for Mac, for Windows. Uh, if you're on Linux, I assume you can do it yourself. Uh, that shows you how to use um, Eclipse. Eclipse is the uh, programming environment in this course. You don't have to use Eclipse if you don't want to, but all of the assignments I give you as Eclipse projects. So whatever way you're programming, you need to figure out how to get what I'm giving you into your programming environment. Right, so if you want to use IntelliJ, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you want to use Visual Studio Code, a lot of students do, it's less straightforward, but it is doable. I can't help you with any of that because I don't use either of them. Um, so uh, the TAs might be able to help you. Uh, I don't know, uh, but I certainly can't. So Eclipse is the official programming environment for this course. Uh, and then finally, there's a whole bunch of source code uh, written for this course, and you have access to it. Link there, you can download the file, uh, import it into Eclipse, uh, and you will see a fairly large body of software uh, that's been written for this course. Okay, and finally, uh, how is the material presented in this course? So the material presented in this course is in the form of lectures. Uh, so basically, I come up here three times a week and talk at you for 15 minutes. Uh, so the only material that I will test you on is the stuff from the lectures uh, and the stuff from the assignments, right? Now, um, there is a lot more to the language than I can tell you in three 15-minute lectures every week. So there, uh, there's a resource that was written for you um, in this uh, thing called Jupyter Notebooks. So I'm just going to show you that now. All right, so yeah, try restarting. Okay, so the notebooks are all online. Uh, and so the way it works is uh, I have no idea who um, has generously donated their server time uh, for everybody to use. So you can create these things called Jupyter Notebooks, and these notebooks run on somebody's server in the world. Uh, the nice thing about the Jupyter Notebooks is that uh, you can put code into your notebook, which looks like a web page, and then you can run the code, again, in what looks like a web page. And so um, you can also edit the contents of the code in the notebook itself. Uh, I'm just going to jump to one of the notebooks that has some uh, code in it. So I'm just going to jump to this integer or floating point notebook. Right? Uh, and so when you look at the notebook, it just looks like a web page. Right? And so this is basically an online textbook where you act, get to interact with the textbook itself. So you can program in the textbook itself, which is kind of cool. Right? And so you can read a little bit about integers in Java. And so uh, for the first few I take what you learn from Cisco 121, so you learn that there are integers in Python, right? And I translate that into the uh, analogous concept in Java, right? So you know that in Python, if you write a number like 10, that's an int, right, or an integer, right? And you can do arithmetic to integers in Python, right? No big, that's not a big surprise. So for example, you can write 10 raised to the power 100, it's a very large number, right? And Python will compute that result for you. Uh, hopefully. The first, so the first time uh, that you run a notebook, when you, uh, in the first time you run a compile, it normally takes a little while for it to pit, spit out a result. So we'll just give this a second, especially if it's Python. So there's a lot going on underneath the hood here that I'm not going to explain right now. Uh, the fact that this works at all is kind of amazing. And then you can scroll down. Uh, so this tells you all about Python integers and what you should have learned about Python integers up here, right? And then it tells you, okay, so how do the Java integers work, right? So in Java, there's something called int, which corresponds to a uh, Java integer, right? And you can do things with int. Oh, this is not going to work for me. Hang on. Sorry, I'm just going to shut this one down. Uh, 
Oh, so I just restarted the notebook. I'm just going to run. Oh, yeah, we'll just give it a second to run. All right, so these notebooks, if, uh, if you do any AI in the future, you're probably going to run across these. The notebooks were originally created uh, with Python in mind. Uh, and so they were meant as a way to distribute text and code uh, all in a nice single package that people could run, uh, edit, so change, and uh, read. Right? Uh, so it's really nice for distributing uh, scientific uh, work because you can send somebody this Jupyter notebook that contains everything that you did to run some experiment or to compute some result, and the person receiving the notebook can replicate that work right away. Right? For education purposes, it's great because you can write a notebook that has code in it and students can fiddle with the code. Right? And so eventually that did print out uh, one followed by, I guess, 100 zeros or something like that. Right? Cell. So this uh, anything in gray is called a code cell. You can change it, right? So I can compute 10 to the 1. You can rerun the cell. It, the second will spit out 10. There you go. Right? And so the code is editable, edit, editable, uh, which is really nice, right? You can read what the code is supposed to do in the notebook, and then you can edit it and play with it uh, to try to understand it in greater right in place. The alternative to doing this is that you read something, either a lecture, a lecture or a notebook or somebody's video, right? And then you have to type that stuff into your editor, into Eclipse or whatever editor you're using. Then it's Java, so you have to compile your program and then run your program and look at the result. Um, and so for the purposes of learning the language, this is a lot more streamlined, right? So we can go down to the Java code down here. Uh, and again, we'll wait a second while this runs. Uh, it should be much faster uh, once you, yeah, there we go. Uh, once you start running, um, uh, once you've run a code cell for the first time. So this was originally written for Python. Uh, I've used an extension that also lets this work for Java, right, uh, and Python at the same time, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you end up with a situation here where it takes a little bit of time to figure out what language are you actually running this code cell in, um, and it takes a minute to, to get working. Okay, so if you run something in uh, Java, right, uh, here I've printed out what is the most negative integer that Java can represent and what is the most positive integer that Java can represent. Right? And so unlike Python, uh, Java has this restriction where uh, this type called int, right, which is roughly corresponds to a Java integer, has a minimum and maximum value. Right. I can't represent an integer value accurately that is less than that. I can't represent an integer value uh, that is greater than that. Right. If I want to represent an integer value that's less than minus 2 billion or greater than 2 billion-ish, right, I have to use a different type. Right. And so we'll talk, about more, we'll talk about this more in detail later on. Right. Can you do a tick with ints? You can. There we go. Right. Uh, output word, okay, right, uh, is, uh, oh, this is not arithmetic, sorry, this is um, showing you signed integers, right, so are the integers signed? Yes, they are, that's good, that corresponds to most people's notion of what an integer is, right, can you calculate stuff with integers? You sure can, right, notice, unlike Python, though, if you want to compute an integer raised to another integer, you can't do it with an operator. Right? Instead, you've got to write something funny, like this. Right? So math dot two comma thirty one. So that's how you can raise to the one in Java. Right? You have to call that sort of looks like a Python function call. Right? And in fact, it's a Java method call. Right? So in Java, methods are the analog to functions in Python. Sort of. It's not entirely accurate, but it's pretty close. Okay. Can you do other arithmetic with integers? You can, right? So here I got one. I've got something x called one. I've got something y whose value is two. I'm going to compute one divided by two, right? And when you do that, you get zero and minus one, right? And so integers in Java don't work the same way they work in Python. They are a little bit different, 
right? In particular, if you take two ints in Java, then the result is always right? Which seems, which doesn't match to your understanding uh, for that you, from mathematics, right? One divided by two is 0 0.5, right? Um, so you're doing everything in integer math, which exists in mathematics as well, right? In Java, it turns out the result is zero. I'll explain more about this later on, right? I'm just showing off the notebooks right now. Okay, so you can go into the notebooks and change the values in the notebook, right? So I can compute minus one divided by two, and it's still zero, right? And you might say, well, this is weird. Can it do division at all? The answer is yes. It's just it's integer division. So minus four divided by two is minus two, right? Um, and later on when I tell you about how integer division actually works, you'll understand why Java is doing this, right? But the point is, is you can go into the code cells, modify them to your heart's content, right? Run them to see if they work, right? If you do something wrong, the code cell will tell you. So if I remove the semicolon, right, you get a little error here, right? And it tells you, hey, there's a semicolon that's missing somewhere. Go back in, fix your error, right, and uh, rerun. And again, it works, right? And so the, uh, you get instant feedback uh, um, from the uh, notebook itself, right, which again is nice. Uh, learning purpose. All right, so if you are working in a notebook and then you go away and get some lunch or something like that and come back, uh, what's gonna happen is, is you're gonna have a message here saying that the notebook has stopped running, right? It'll give you an option to restart it, uh, usually that doesn't work, especially if you've gone away for a long time, right? So, uh, because this is running on someone else's server somewhere in the world, right, if the, uh, if Jupyter notices it hasn't been used for some period of time, I think it's like five or 10 minutes, uh, it shuts the notebook down, right? So the person's server that's hosting the notebook doesn't have to be doing any more work waiting for you. Right? Uh, so don't be surprised if you come back to a notebook and it says it's, it's no longer working. Right, you have to reload the notebook. Uh, I don't remember if your check kept or not. Um, so they probably not. So that's another uh, thing that you have to be aware of. Right? If you're working through a notebook and you want to remember what's there, uh, you have to uh, you have to make sure that you're always doing something on the notebook page. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna get to that later on, of course. Don't worry about that. <laughs> this is this is just showing you the notebook. Don't worry about the Java. Yeah. Uh, what do you do? Uh, there is a link on Anki. So under Electrofiles, oh, you can hit that link right there. Okay. If you know how to use Git uh, and GitHub, uh, you can pull all of this from my GitHub repository. Uh, so there's a link on Q there uh, that also tells you how to pull it from uh, GitHub. What else is there? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so one of the other things that students always ask, well, not, uh, that some students will ask for is um, exercises, right? And that's why textbooks were created. That is the primary reason for textbooks, right? There are exercises in these textbooks that you can use. Because um, the only way you can actually learn how to program is to actually go in and do some programming. So all of your notebooks have exercises, they're either embedded in the notebook somewhere in the notebook itself or at the end, right? So at the end of this notebook, there are exercises. There is room for you to fill in your answers for the exercise, right? Uh, so there's, uh, this, uh, this question is asking you to uh, look at Python's floor division and Java's integer division and compare them to see how they, if they're the same or different, right? And then there's a bunch of other exercises for you as well. Right, that you can do, right? The next thing that a student, uh, many students will ask for, is, well, that's great, I mean, these exercises, but how do I So the answer is, you go back to your notebook. Oh, here, sorry, restarting. So this is what happens if you, uh, if you uh, load a notebook and then go away, right? Okay, so if you don't go away too long, the notebook will come back. Uh, if you do go away for more than five or 10 minutes, I'm pretty sure it shuts down. So at the end of every major part, so there's four parts to this course, you can click on the exercise solutions. The solutions for every notebook in that part live in this notebook. You can modify the solutions and see what happens when you modify the solutions, right? So here they are. There's exercise one from the notebook dynamic versus static typing, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
Uh, there is an enormous amount of information in these notebooks for you to access if you want it. If you don't want it, that's fine, right? Uh, but if you want more uh, information about uh, than I can tell you during the lectures, and if you want programming uh, exercises, they're all in the notebooks for you. The answers are here as well, right? Cool. Okay. Um, all right, any questions about the course so far? So if you go to the lectures page, uh, uh, in the first column, you'll find the PowerPoint. Second column, you'll find the PDF, but there's, they, they don't all of them, because I haven't uh, had the time to export the PDF, the PowerPoint, the PDF for all of them. It also doesn't work very well if there's animations in the PowerPoint. Uh, so you get the PDF and it just looks like a mess. All lectures will show up on the YouTube playlist eventually. Uh, sometimes it takes two weeks for me to get a lecture up because I've got other stuff to do in a timely fashion. And finally, if you are using the notebooks or want to use them for something, the uh, right-hand column roughly corresponds to what you talked, what I talked about uh, during the lecture. Roughly, it's not exact, right? Uh, so it's approximate. So if you want to keep up with the notebook readings, they're over here uh, in the right-hand column. Yes. Uh, probably lectures, because the lecture. Yeah, the le I'm only going to ask you stuff from the lectures. PowerPoint, the PowerPoint lectures, right? And so the, um, the for yeah extra information, right? If you if there, I've talked about something in class and you don't quite understand what's going on, the notebook probably has a more explanation of what's happening. It also has exercises for you to uh, work on. Right? Again, the only way that you're actually going to learn how to program is to do programming. You only have assignments in the course, right? So you're not actually doing the course. Uh, if you really want to learn the material, you have to spend your own time working on programming problems in Java. Right? The notebooks are one source of these pro uh, programming problems. The other problem, so one of the problems with the notebooks is that uh, they don't always work. So you might go and load up the notebook and realize that it won't load for some reason. Again, this is because this notebook is being hosted on some server somewhere in the world, right? And so um, it's not, it doesn't have 100% uptime. Uh, so if you're studying for a test or something like that and you, it's like the night before or like three in the morning and you go to load up a notebook, uh, you might be, have to be prepared to have a bad time and not be able to look at that notebook. Right? Uh, so they are a resource for you to use. You probably shouldn't rely on them 100% right? as your only source of information. It used to be the case that I would tell you how to install these on your own computers. However, the uh, software that I'm actually using the notebooks many years ago no longer works on Macs. So about half the students here now have a Mac, which means they won't be able to run it on their computer. Called uh, on Windows is a pain in the butt, uh, and so provide the uh, online version of the notebooks. All right. Um, any other questions? Super. I think I will call it quits uh, there. Now, I guess in the next lecture, we'll actually start to learn about Java um, proper. <laughs>